So my name is Hope Knight and I am President and CEO of the Greater Jamaica Development Corporation. And welcome to the panel, Creating Jobs, Preserving Communities. In this brief time that we have to spend together, we will address the challenges of achieving inclusive economic growth in the region with our panel of expert practitioners who will talk about how we achieve this objective. Now, let me set the table for this discussion. In the 25 years from 1990 to 2015, the region created 1.8 million jobs. For us to keep pace with the increasing population growth, we'll need to add another 1.9 million jobs by 2040. Concentrating new employment precisely in the region's traditional business core puts our economic head in the mouth of our infrastructure lion. And we're going to need locations close to, but outside of the core to support this new growth. Places like Long Island City, Jersey City, Jamaica, Newark, and legacy cities around the region like Patterson, Bridgeport, and Waterbury. These locations, however, house established communities, some of them vulnerable to change, and RPA's fourth plan includes copious recommendations related to the challenge of accommodating growth and preserving communities. A few of those recommendations are especially relevant for today's discussion, and they include the following. Protect low-income residents from being displaced from urban areas where many reside by building wealth in communities that have suffered disinvestment strengthening rent regulations and protections, and ending homelessness through increased funding for portable and supportive housing. Make planning decisions more inclusively by expanding and simplifying ways for the public to participate. Expand access to economic opportunity through equitable procurement and contracting, workforce training, investments in transit that link people to social resources and economic opportunity. Now I would like to introduce our distinguished panelists. Uh, we have Ross Baraka, Mayor of City of Newark, New Jersey. Marisa Largo, Director of New York City, Department of City Planning and Chair of the City Planning Commission. Tim Sullivan, CEO, New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Holly Light, Executive Vice President of Real Estate Development and Planning, the Empire State Development Corporation, and Laura Current, County Executive, Nassau County. So to kick off this conversation, I'd like to um, ask each of you to talk about an economic development project that you worked on that either succeeded or fell short, and what led to that outcome. In particular, what were the goals of the project? Who were the parties involved? What did the community members think of the project? And what do you think your team did well or could have done better in designing the project? And I'll just, I'll start with Laura. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can everybody hear me? All right, good. So I, I think the biggest story we've got going on in Nassau right now is our hub. It is literally right in the center of Nassau County. Nassau County is about 450 square miles. And has anyone been to the Nassau Coliseum to see the Islanders or a concert or something like that? All right, so a lot of people know it. So if you've been there, you see that it's surrounded by about 60 acres of parking lot, just sitting there, not generating any revenue. So for the past 20 years, there has been plan after plan to develop this, to do housing, to do retail, to do some kind of transportation, to, to make something out of this. And time after time, the plans have died, either through squabbling, political bickering, uh, perhaps the plans were too ambitious for the communities around, whatever it was, these plans died. So uh, when I took office about 15 months ago, I knew this was something that we had to do. Um, and I'm very happy to report that while we do not have shovels in the ground yet, we are further along in getting stuff done than we have ever been. So working with my county legislature, which is uh, it's majority Republican, I'm a Democrat, often it's that kind of uh, bickering there that stops this kind of development. We were able to get in a bipartisan, unanimous fashion, our legislature to approve a development deal between RxR Realty and the operators of the Coliseum, BSE Global, that also operates Barclays in Brooklyn. 
So they have a plan, they have come up with a plan to do 500 units of housing, which we desperately need in Nassau County. New Jersey is outpacing us by far when it comes to building housing for young people. Northwell Health is going to build an innovation facility, a research facility, medical research for high wage jobs. And the third part of the plan is retail and entertainment to complement the use of the Coliseum. So if you go to an Islanders game while well, Belmont is being built, or you go to a Billy Joel concert or whatever, there'll be fun stuff to do there. The state has committed to money for a parking garage to free up that space for development, along with pedestrian bridges. So we have the Nassau Community College right there, and we have Hofstra University, pedestrian bridges over the roadways into there to sort of add the connectivity. There are no train stations near there. We have a great Long Island Railroad system, but there's no train station right there, so we're working on bus, rapid bus transit. transit. We have train stations not too far away. So it's sort of my vision for Nassau to make a live, work, play dynamic. So you've got the live with the 500 units of housing, and it's already zoned by the town of Hempstead for that, because in the past that had been a source of bickering. You've got the work with the high wage jobs at the innovation facility, and you've got the play with the retail, entertainment, and the Coliseum. So the, uh, the other thing that we've done, and I think why this is a success, is often we find that the community can be an impediment, the nimbyism, to getting stuff done. So we have loved the community, we have been with the community, we are deeply entrenched with the community, and we have gathered community stakeholders into a big community, advi community benefits advisory board. The developer has agreed to $1 of built out of every square foot of built out space. So that will be about somewhere from 60 to 70 million dollars for community benefits. That's a very important commitment. That's got the community mostly happy with this so far, mostly bought in. We also worked hard to get a project labor agreement, which we know makes it easier to pass through the legislature. So I am very excited about this. I'm excited because there will be housing, there will be jobs, it will grow our tax base, people will be spending more money in Nassau. But more important than that, I think it's, it's good for our self-respect as a county. For too long, we have been seen as the land of no. So the fact that we are further along than we've ever been, I think shows the rest of the world that we are open for business and we are ready to embrace the future in Nassau. So just one follow-up question. Yeah. What do you think made the difference with this project versus other efforts? I think, speaking just very politically, I think um, at the town of Hempstead, which controls the zoning, we don't do the zoning on the county level, they have been attacked. I mean, the Islanders fans hated the old regime for driving out the Islanders. Uh, there was a lot of negativity toward them. I think our legislature sees that this is a political home run to finally move forward. So the stars are aligned politically. Also, we have a great developer, a great development team. The Coliseum is doing a great job, you know, Scott. Reckler of RxR has real credibility with the community. He's a local guy. Uh, so the stars have aligned in such a way. Plus, I've got a very good team. Evelyn Simmis, who's my economic development person, is here. <laughs> and we've worked re really hard, right from day one, to strategize on how to do this, how to get the community bought in, how to get labor bought in, how to pave the way for the, for the politics of it. So it's all about getting in early and making sure that you cover everything that you possibly can. Great. Thank you, Hope. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some other underutilized uh, parking lots in, Laura, in Laura's uh, <laughs> yes. county, um, a project that um, ESD has been leading to redevelop the parking lots around Belmont Park, which um, basically get utilized once a year and just um, house cars for car dealers the rest of the time. So. <clears throat> um, I've been at ESD about two years now, and I don't have a project that is completed yet, and I, that shouldn't surprise anyone. So we are not quite at success either on this, but we are, we are close, and I think there's a lot of lessons. Um, I would worked for New York City for a long time, and so um, we're you know, very familiar with the Euler process, which is the land use disposition process. Very regimented time frames, who has to see it coming to the state, there is very little um, other than CEQRA, the, the environmental quality review process that you have to do for community outreach. Um, and to me, you know, that has been something I think that has made a lot of communities very nervous about working with the state. Um, my, I saw this as an opportunity to go way beyond what I felt we even did in ULERP when I worked for the city. And I think Belmont has been 
a real case in point for that. Um, we've done, you know, the whole secret process, the 18, 22 months of putting together our EIS and doing public hearings. But what we've done beyond that, I think, is what's most exciting to me. Um, in, our, in the um, Urban Development Corporation Act, which is what regulates ESD, there's kind of a vague reference to the um, ability to start community advisory councils. That's about the extent of, of our regulations on, on community outreach. Um, we created a CAC at the beginning of Belmont that has all the elected officials involved as well as other community stakeholders. Um, we met with them at the beginning, probably every other week. Um, now it's about monthly. <clears throat> We've had town hall meetings, uh, Q and A's with the development team. Um, we got input before we put an RFP out from the public and then have um, been getting input ever since. So by the time we even released our draft EIS, we had changed the site plan and the project significantly just based on the input we were getting through our town hall process and through our CAC. Um, some of the big issues that had come up was um, there was a proposed hotel in this project. So the development project is proposed to be the new um, Islanders Stadium to bring them back to Nassau County, um, as well as a outlet retail village and a hotel and sort of restaurants, um, F&B. <clears throat> so the hotel was originally going to be up to 250 feet. That really concerned neighbors. It's mostly in a single family home area. Um, so we brought that down um, by 100 feet before we even got to DEIS. There was concern about where the substation was going to be located in proximity to a schoolyard. We moved that over by the Cross Island, away from where people were living or going to school. Um, we had a plan for a new recreational park that would be close to the backyards of some houses. <clears throat> we got a lot of uh, concern about that. Also, just that the location of Belmont is away from where kids tend to be. Um, they can't walk there. So we were asked instead to look at renovating a park right in the middle of Elmont um, that ha definitely needs some TLC. And um, so instead, we just, uh, I guess two weeks ago, had a big community workshop where we invited residents in to come talk about why they love that park and what can be improved and what they want to see. It was really exciting. We had small workshops, um, small facilitated groups, people reported out. We had family, a lot of families came, probably about 75 people. Um, mo moms and dads brought their kids. It was great. And that will then you know, go into the design for the park, what we heard that day. So um, we are close. We are between our DEIS and our final EIS at this point. Um, but I think we've really seen, we also extended our EIS a lot. We got more comments than we've ever gotten on a project before. Um, and one of the biggest um, was traffic concerns <coughs> and concerns about increasing service for the LIRR, the Long Island Railroad, um, to, to provide some ease on the Cross Island. So we extended our EIS period to make sure we, we could respond fully to all comments. And we also are now studying, we're adding to our EIS a study of a full-time um, new station at, at Belmont. Um, so I think for me, this is the most, in my time of doing a lot of EISs, that um, I've ever seen a project change quite this much during that process. Um, and so I think that it is a little bit of an irony to me, because I know people are always like, ah, the state doesn't have Euler if you're going to do crazy things. But <laughs> for us in this, it's actually been quite the opposite, that we've really um, had a very close working relationship um, with the community. And hopefully we will uh, see this project approved soon. Great. Morning, everybody. Um, it's it's uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for uh, the chance to, to visit with you. Um, so, like Holly, I'm uh, I'm not as new as I used to be, but I'm still pretty new in in, uh, in my job. I've been working for Governor Murphy, uh, running the Economic Development Authority in New Jersey for about 13 or 14 months. And so, I also we also don't have a lot of after uh, <laughs> pictures to describe, uh, though there are great things happening in New Jersey, particularly in, in Newark. And I'm sure Mayor Baraka will talk about those in a couple minutes. I don't want to steal his thunder. Um, a couple things that you know, I would say. I've, so I'm on my, as a couple of people have joked, um, I'm sort of on my third tour of duty in the tri-state uh, economic development uh, circuit. There's no more circuits left, so I either have to stay in this job or move to Delaware or something. Because <laughs> um, I was in New York City working for Mayor Bloomberg, then for Governor Malloy in Connecticut, and now for Governor Murphy in my home state of New Jersey. So I do 
plan to stay if they'll have me. Um, but you know, so a couple of things we're focused on, um, sort of as a, at a macro, uh, macro strategic level. One of the things that New Jersey was known for and and, and, and earned its sort of seat at the table economically in the in the 20th century was the sort of the innovation economy and the the pipeline from research and development at the sort of academic and corporate space into the commercialization and startup economy. Whether you think about Bell Labs, whether you think about um, Sarnoff Labs, or th there's this wonderful heritage from sort of 19 post-war through the kind of 70s uh, and through the 80s, uh, where we sort of had a, a you know place of pride in the innovation economy. That has fallen off quite a bit. Um, we were as recently as 2007 fifth in the country for venture capital. We're down to 15th. Uh, once you fall out of the top 10, that's not a good group. Um, no disrespect to whoever's number 13 or 14, but <laughs> you want to be in the top. When you're doing state rankings and you're in the Northeast, you got to be in the top five to seven, or you're not in a good spot. Um, that has fallen off. Um, you know, we've had disinvestment in transit, and Governor Murphy is, is laser focused on fixing New Jersey transit and getting that right. I'm sure Kevin and his team are here somewhere, making the case for how they're doing, and that's how important that is. Um, we we think the sort of the future of New Jersey is leveraged entirely to its cities. Um, and again, I don't want to steal Mayor Baraka's thunder because what they're doing is, is, is at the head of the pack in terms of what's going on at the, the local and municipal level. But I think one of the things we're trying to do uh, sort of from an administration perspective is reorient how our, how the state and particularly my organization thinks about partnering with cities. Um, we have uh, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly earned some of the criticism of being sort of a, a, a Trenton-based Bigfoot that will come in and not do a lot of collaboration and coordination and that. I want to say it won't happen under my watch, but I'm going to try and diminish it as much as we can, uh, because that's not how good projects come come to come together. Uh, we're working on a big project uh, that we've started, and there's no shovels in the ground yet either in New Brunswick. And if you haven't been to New Brunswick in a while, by the way, you should go. Um, it's uh, Rutgers has done a lot of great things to bring a lot of its um, a lot of its operations and, and classroom space back downtown, back by the train station, uh, and it's got a real vibrancy, and it feels like a college town, and it's got a lot of good things going. And it's still the global headquarters of Johnson and Johnson right across the street from the train station. So it's like a vibrant, dynamic place. Um, there's a big hole in the ground where we're hoping to build a, a, about a four million square foot um, um, research and development and sort of commercialization hub. We're also calling it the hub, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You're in a different state. Technically, <laughs> New Brunswick calls itself the hub city. I don't know sort of where, how long that three dates. So we'll see who owes who royalties on that. Um, but, uh, but good luck to your project as well. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we're trying to bring together, and this is a bit of a, um, a fairly shameless ripoff of, of what Mayor Bloomberg did on Roosevelt Island, and trying to bring mm -hmm. together higher education, academic um, uh, sort of higher education, and the academic research model with corporate uh, R and D and sort of startup world with mixed use and retail and all the fun things that would surround that. Um, so Rutgers is a partner of ours. The city of New Brunswick, the county of Middlesex County, is a partner, and so it's. Um, it's a, it's a big group of partners, and that means it's a lot of stakeholder engagement, it's a lot of stakeholder management. I would say um, the only kind of piece of advice or, or commentary I'd offer as we think about sort of engagement, you, you can't make up community engagement in the air. You can't make that up later in the process. If you don't mm -hmm. start right, if you come out of the box wrong, you're very, the products we all hear about and talk about when we all sort of furrow our brow and say, why can't things get done? It's almost always the ones where you didn't start out right. Um, if you, and the ones we don't hear about are the ones that started out right and go along fine, and it's not on the front page of the newspaper, and it's not, all the storm and drying of, of uh, you know, uh, combativeness. I think about a project that Mike Piscitelli is here from Mayor Harp's team in, in New Haven, a project we did, which is really exciting, which converted an old bus garage in a neighborhood that is kind of halfway between, it's residential on one side and kind of industrial on the other side. You can imagine the conversion of that into sort of a mixed-use space would raise lots of uh, questions. One of the things we did, it was a state-owned piece of property. We partnered very closely with the city. We actually let them do the RFP for who the developer was going to be because it was going to have to go through their zoning and through their, their pilot process. We said, you guys, you know, we'll sit on the committee with you, but we'll figure it out. But they also smartly put the local alder or two. Alder really is a Connecticut word. I haven't used that word since I left Connecticut. An alder, <laughs> an alder person. We don't have those. We have freeholders uh, in New Jersey. We don't have alder people. Um, uh, but they put the local alderman and alder woman uh, on the selection committee for the RFP process. And so they were fully bought in and the developer was picked as part of dealing with them. And it was not a surprise. They didn't read about it in the newspaper. And that project went, you know, not without its bumps in the road, but um, went really, <coughs> really, really smoothly and I think was embraced by the community and the, and the broader city. Um, so if you not if you don't start out purposefully thinking about this stuff on the, from the get go in Hollywood, you described as, as what you're doing on, on the project you were just describing sounds exactly right. If you you just can't make that up later, you can't do that in the sixth inning of the game. Uh, it just can't happen. Um, it won't work. And so I think being having a sort of a purposeful partnering mentality from the state level organizations, as Holly said, I, the the tools you have at the state are real different than you have at the local level. Um, 
and they're not as fun in most cases because <laughs> the, the, the locals control um, you know zoning <laughs> and you know pi- pilots and all that kind of good stuff where you have a real opportunity to negotiate stuff. We don't have those, um, and so partnering in a very purposeful and and, try, and and requiring planning, requiring collaboration among your partners is, uh, with the communities that in, in which these developments are happening is enormously important. So that's something that, that's how we're thinking about it at least Great. attitudinally. Well, I am also going to talk about a hub. When people think of a hub in the context of New York City, they usually think about Manhattan. But to give some context, New York City is the only old industrial city that has surpassed in population the 1970s peak. We all know that after the 70s, there was depopulation. And in addition to bursting at the seams with people, we also have an all-time high on jobs. We have four and a half million jobs. So we are very focused on creating job hubs, job centers outside of Manhattan. Hope sits atop one of them in Jamaica, wearing your Greater Jamaica Development Corporation hat. Long Island City is another, but maybe it's because I'm from Brooklyn. I'm gonna talk about downtown Brooklyn. To give a sense of downtown Brooklyn, It has 2.6 million people. Um, It follows New York City, LA, and Chicago as the nation's largest city. And downtown Brooklyn also has 11 institutions of higher learning with 65,000 students. That's more than Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. The final piece of the mix that makes downtown Brooklyn such an attractive hub, 11 subway lines, the Long Island Railroad, and 10 bus lines to boot. In 2004, city planning rezoned downtown Brooklyn, and there's been a lot of comment about the fact that the projects being described don't yet have shovels in the ground. When one does land use zoning development, it's a long-term play. That In 2004, when we city planning and the city council rezoned downtown Brooklyn, there were fewer than 1,000 housing units. If you fast forward to today, just 15 years later, and in zoning terms, 15 years is just, there are 12,000 housing units and 2,000 of them affordable. So there are twice as many affordable housing units in downtown Brooklyn today as there were total 15 years ago. Now, we had thought when we rezoned downtown Brooklyn that we would see a mix of residential and commercial. We were wrong. The economics, the market was white hot for housing. There is a lot of space for offices in downtown Brooklyn, but it's uh, mostly rehabbing older buildings. So we were very focused on creating new office space to meet the needs of today's tenants and in this location where people could walk, bicycle, skateboard to work. Because any of those residents that we employ, that are employed in downtown Brooklyn, means they're not getting onto the subways crossing onto an island. And a large part of our focus on these hubs outside of Manhattan is to address, one, the desires of a millennial workforce to be able to commute on foot or bicycle, but also to address transit capacity. So the project I'm going to mention is 80 Flatbush Avenue. This one has been through the Euler process, (laughs) approved by the city council, and an important fact in New York City development, it is past the period during which it can be sued to stop the project. (laughs) Um, This is a public-private partnership at its best. It is a mix of privately owned land with land owned by the Department of Education, so city-owned land. And what was approved was 870 apartments, 200 of them permanently affordable, two new schools, And as originally proposed, it was going to be 250,000 square feet of commercial space, which would have been about 1,000 jobs. Now, here's the challenge. The site is atop this transit hub. It's across the street from the Williamsburg Savings Bank building. And before the recent building boom, for decades, all one saw on the Brooklyn skyline was that lonely tower sitting there. Um, It was viewed as an embarrassment. Why, for over 50 years, has there only been this one tower? So a perfect site for a tall building. But it is also directly across the street from Brownstone, Brooklyn. So it is a site that uh, poses all of the challenges of edge conditions in the same way that you described residential and industrial boundaries. Um, 
there was very significant opposition from the community that lived there. And what is interesting, the community that was testifying against it in many ways were the gentrifiers of the 70s, 80s, mm -hmm. and 90s. But now living there and valuing their gorgeous community were opposed to the development. Um, the result was that the office space got cut back to 100,000 square feet, so 450 fewer jobs. Um, personally, I would have liked to have seen the additional space, particularly because the developers are architect developers and, to your point, from the outset, engaged with the community, changed the locations of different entries, changed the massings, the setback, to be sensitive to the neighboring um, community. But I'm also a realist, and I consider the fact that this project is going to combine office space, permanently affordable housing, market rate housing, and two schools as a success. <laughs> Mayor? Thank you. I don't know if I could compete with that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, mean, it's, it's, I want to talk more, uh, you know, granular about some of the things that are, that are happening in Newark uh, and, very, and something very specific that I think applies to the panel itself around equitable growth and development. I mean, I could talk about the, the Mars Confectionery Project, which I think uh, talks about the kind of uh, collaboration we have with the state, the jobs that it's going to create in the city, 350 jobs, and uh, the opportunity that uh, that is going to be created because of that and, and its connection to the Mulberry Commons that we've also uh, uh, began to do in the city that we're going to cut a ribbon for in, the, in the next month. Uh, that creates three acres of, of a park a walking bridge eventually, uh, kind of modeled after the High Line here in New York City. It will trigger thousands of, of units of residential, commercial, uh, uh, um, and um, you know, industrial, not industrial, uh, office space uh, around that area. But you know, what I was thinking here, sitting here thinking about is, you know, we have these meetings in the city. Right? We have a meeting, community meetings. Uh, you know, that we organize. And in the community meetings, guys come, and folks come, and they talk about development and how they can get involved in the city's growing economic market, how they could be a part of it. And there's three guys who came who are residents of, the, of, of Newark, African-American, young uh, residents of the city. They met each other at the meeting. They formed a LLC, uh, a partnership there. Uh, you know, after they after they did that, they got involved in in, in a new ordinance that we created that requires uh, some of these developers to have minority co-development as a part of the projects when they get in city subsidy, and so now they have three projects that they are, are doing in the community, not in the downtown area. Uh, one across the street from uh, Weekway High School, one of the schools there. Another one up the street on Lions Avenue, which is the one I like the most because we are condoing out. Uh, the bottom floor, and we're turning it into an artist workspace uh, for the residents in the community and residential uh, going up. Uh, these guys uh, by themselves have different businesses. Together, this is their first uh, foray into development. And so I'm very proud of the work that my folks are doing around trying to uh, hold these people's hands, develop uh, their capacity uh, to get involved in the economic growth of, of the city and going to areas where uh, the, the folks have not figured out uh, that they're going to make a lot of money yet yet, so they haven't ran up there and, and tried to uh, stake a claim in that area and make it impossible for anybody to do anything. So these still young uh, developers in the city have an opportunity to go to places in Newark uh, and develop an, an imaginative kind of projects uh, that are also in partnership with us uh, in the city to create what we think those areas of the community need and gives us a chance to empower people in the community to be a part of the economic growth that's happening uh, in the city uh, and to create affordability, create affordable housing, create, uh, like I said, artist workspaces, uh, all kinds of things that we think are important to uh, having a balanced kind of growth and development in the city without throwing people out, uh, without, uh, you know, feeding the anxiety that uh, displacement is coming. Uh, you know, this big behemoth of, of capital that's going to be invested in our communities, going to chase us all to Pennsylvania. Uh, there's no way for us to get involved in this. And so we, we tell people one of the best ways to uh, fight against gentrification is ownership. Uh, and we're trying to get them to own property and develop property themselves 
particularly property that these folks don't seem to be interested in yet, uh, but they will be if you follow how, it, how the models work in, in, say, New York, for example. I mean, there were times when people weren't interested in East New York. They weren't interested in the South Bronx, right? Now, you know, you probably can't get into the South Bronx. Uh, so we, we are focusing people on those areas now to get them to develop those areas, to stake a claim in that while they still can do that uh, and while it's still economically viable at the same time. Uh, so I'm, I'm very proud uh, of that, of their work, and, and, and there are a lot of other stories like that that we can talk about. Great. So many of the examples that you've given really exemplify contented growth. I want to talk about contentious growth. Mm. And, you know, when communities object to growth, is it really about growth or is it about other things? So That's such an important <laughs> and good question. Uh, we in Nassau, so I'm very jealous. I hear what's happening in New Jersey <coughs> with housing. I hear what's happening in New York City with housing. In Nassau County, we should be keeping more of our young people. We have wonderful schools, K-12, universities. You know, we spend a lot of money in our public schools for our public schools, and too many of our young people just leave. We've got a brain drain. And the reason for that is very simple. Number one, young people can't afford to live in Nassau County. Number two, all too often they don't want to live in Nassau County because it's kind of boring compared to other places. Uh, so I am very bullish. I almost feel like I have to proselytize about this everywhere I go, and that's transit-oriented development. As I mentioned before, we have beautiful train stations, we have beautiful train service. I know people complain about it, but it's still very good. And there are a few communities where they build apartment buildings. So for instance, I don't know if anyone's been to Farmingdale lately. Uh, there's a beautiful, just in the past five years, they built rental apartments right by the train station. When, at, since that's happened, the downtown, the main street, is now completely full. It's a, it's a real restaurant destination. People go all the time. The biggest problem is you can't find a parking spot, which is a good problem to have because it means it's vibrant. People are spending their money. Five years ago, every other storefront was empty. It was just a sad sort of ghost town kind of feeling. Uh, there are some, some small successes like that in some of our other smaller municipalities. Uh, on the county level, we don't control the zoning, so it really takes courageous, and this is where the contentious part comes <coughs> in, it takes courageous town supervisors and mayors to say, this is what we need to do, let's get it done. Because all too often we find that the NIMBYs come out, people don't like change, in Nassau County, it's often because, oh, it's those people are going to move in. You know, we don't want those people in our community. Change is scary. So our point is, it's not those people. It's us. It's our parents. It's our kids. Um, it's us when we don't want to mow the lawn anymore. Um, because, you know, you, there's such a cliche now. So many young people, they graduate college, they come home, and they live in the basement. I mean, that's not a good life. That's not what we want. We need to grow the tax base. We need to create more environments for young people to live. In the same amount of time that northern New Jersey created a, what it's, it's your geography, Marisa, it's your geography of job study, 16,000 units of housing were permitted in Long Island in the past eight years. In that same period of time, northern New Jersey did about 10 times that. So we're getting all these wonderful jobs in the area, but we're not getting the people in Nassau County. Our taxes are very high. I mean, personally, I moved to Nassau County from the city because I wanted that suburban quality of life. I wanted the schools and the yard and, you know, the whole nine yards. But we can't afford it anymore. It's becoming unaffordable for too many of us. We need that density where it makes sense by our, by our transit hubs to be able to continue to afford what we love about suburbia. Now, the contentiousness is very difficult because we have many layers of government in NASA. We have about 300 independent taxing jurisdictions, which means you have a lot of elected officials, which means that when people come with the sign saying, we hate this, we don't want this, elected officials are like, oh, I don't want that headache. Okay, no, we won't do anything. So that's why we're in the pickle that we're in. So I feel that my job is to advocate for these kinds of developments where, where I can without stepping on the toes of the mayors and the supervisors because it's really their decision. And as you know, local politics can be very complicated and contentious. So if I'm sticking my nose out, I just was talking to someone from Garden City, when I stick my nose out and advocate for someone, I'm embroiling myself in a lot of local politics that I don't know about and I don't necessarily want to get involved with. So everywhere I go, wherever I go around the county, I talk about the successes, what we can gain from this. 
One thing that comes up all the time is if you build too much housing, if you have apartments, our schools will be overcrowded. So there's data that says for every unit of multifamily housing, it's 0.16 child. For, every, for all over the housing, for every unit of every kind of housing, it's 0.5 children. So you, there's actually fewer children in multi-use housing. I say that to people, they don't really believe it, but I feel we need to repeat it over and over. Um, we have someone from our IDA here, say hello. <laughs> Wow. See, there you go. It's contentious. A lot going on. But that's something that at the county level we do have some say over what gets built. If we give a pilot to a housing development, we make sure that there's an affordable housing component to that. If, we're, if our taxpayers are investing in housing, we want to make sure that we're giving something back in terms of affordable housing. So in Nassau County, and I'll stop talking in a minute, in Nassau County, affordable housing, you couldn't say the words. You know, it would be, ugh, the sky would fall. Now, I think things are changing. You can talk about affordable housing. It's okay to talk about it. People see the need. And uh, the bottom line is we've got to keep our young people, attract the jobs, and grow our tax base. And it all starts with housing. I would just have, I guess, two quick comments. First of all, Belmont is not without its contention. We have two, um, the, the community in which it is, Belmont, is very supportive um, in general because they need jobs, they want jobs, they want money to come into that community. There is another adjacent community um, that is more of a bedroom community and is not so excited about change. And I think there is a point where you can no matter how much community input and listening you do, there comes a point where some people will always not want a project, and that's when Laura's point about leadership is so essential, um, because there have to be leaders that are looking at big picture of what is good for the overall economy, for the overall county, for the overall state. Um, but one, one point that I see a lot in New York City um, is, the, the very knee-jerk and, and real, in many cases, fear of displacement and gentrification. And I think um, we've gotten to a place that, that it's so emotional that we've kind of gotten away from the facts. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the most important things that we can do, and I know I give um, city planning a lot of credit for starting to do this, is to step back and say, let's really study very carefully what the housing makeup of this community that we're doing this project or rezoning in is. Um, what are the threats? You know, I mean, I saw this a lot in Long Island City. There, there is a fear of displacement, and yet it's the fastest growing residential community in the country. Um, there's a lot of home ownership there. So when I was trying to parse with people, what, what is the real fear? Obviously, we always have to be vigilant if we're doing a major economic project or rezoning. But let's parse into facts, um, because we don't do anyone a disservice in communities um, if we just play into that fear and don't really understand what we're actually working with. And I think um, looking at growth regionally is a big part of that, looking at housing. Um, before this job, I was the regional administrator for New York and New Jersey for HUD. And after working just in New York City for many years on housing, it was like this revelation. Oh, hi, Yonkers. Wow, we can, you can have people live there who can afford it and work in the city. And that, I think, for all of us here, that is one of the, the big, um, the big to-do list items, is figuring out how to think about affordable housing and housing and growth in a regional way. Yeah, um, I think about a couple things. One. And maybe there's a distinction without a difference, but I think it's important that I think there's a different perception of when products are there's a difference between development and growth. Often they're coincident, but they're not the same thing. Um, something that is growth and adding to the to the to the economic vitality of a neighborhood or of a community is real different than just plopping in a bunch of housing units that are cordoned off, you know, or, or people come and go, they don't do much, they don't shop, they may generate tax revenues, but what does a local resident care about that? versus something that is truly adding growth and vitality to a neighborhood. Again, you can do both at the same time, but they don't have to happen at the same time. And so I bet if we did a study of the most sort of bumptious approval processes in the last 25 years in the region, there's probably a correlation between places that put uh, situations that were, that were shuffling the pieces around versus actually creating economic growth. Uh, and there's a, because you can make a much stronger case when you're actually bringing growth and you're actually bringing um, growth that will have a, a significant spillover effect into the parcel next door and the community that surrounds it, uh, I think you have a much better case you can make. Um, I think 
Holly's point, and I'm deeply respectful and appreciative of the work that city planning does, not just for New York City, but for the region. Um, planning, good planning matters such a, so much. I mean, this is a, to state an obvious thing at the Regional Plan Association. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably, you, you accept the premise of my naive, ignorant statement. But Mayor Brock talked about the anxiety and sort of the, 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 the fears of, um, of folks there's you know huge waves of investment coming what's that going to mean for me what's that going to mean for the places i've you know lived my entire life and that's a totally totally fair and understandable fear particularly if you know, watch what's gone on in other places one of the places this is actually manifesting itself and i'm sure this is true in the other communities as well is opportunity zones um are right everyone's sort of super excited about it we'll see how they play out the new rules came out this week but there's this sort of particularly this, the the smaller scale urban places that have had opportunity zones designated in them there's this sort of fear that there's a giant tsunami is about to wash over them and what's going to happen and a bunch of money is going to come into the community exactly as the mayor said. What does that mean? Well, projects that tend to be sort of developer proposed and someone rolls in in a town car and says, hey, you know what we think this, this community needs is X, is a real different conversation than a plan. You know, the community has come up with a plan. The mayor and the council and whoever the relevant local folks are have come up with a plan saying, hey, you know what we need here? This would be a great set for affordable housing or a supermarket or a, you know, whatever whatever you want. Um, it's a totally different conversation. And I think that's, uh, that, that I think, and I think if, if you look for things that will sort of be hallmarks of the most contentious situations, it's, if it's somebody else's idea being shopped to a community versus the community's idea being shopped to a developer, I think you have a totally different tone and tenor of that conversation. We're trying to help with that on the Opportunity Zone side in New Jersey. We're putting some money on the table um, to help local communities do some planning so they can put, so they can then have a, a prospectus, for lack of a better word, that they can turn around and, and talk to these opportunity funds about, hey, here's what we'd like to see at the corner of X and Y Street. We think this is the place for a supermarket as opposed to, again, someone showing up on, on New Jersey Transit and just showing up and saying, hey, we, we've got a, we've got a, a great idea for you. Um, and so we're trying to help, again, partner with local communities in a very different kind of way than my organization has historically. So. It's important. So planning is important. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> um, before answering the question, Hope, I want to pick up on two comments that other panelists made. Um, the county executive has referred repeatedly to transit-oriented development. I'll just note that at the Department of City Planning, it's not a term that we use. Yeah. It's what we do. It's yeah. <laughs> just the nature of it. Um, I also appreciate the continued emphasis on facts. The Department of City Planning is a major research institution. We have planning divisions dedicated to housing, to economics, to infrastructure, to transportation, to waterfront. And the commission itself, Hope sits on the commission, is very, very fact-based. Um, yes, we live in a political with a lowercase p environment, but planning has to be driven by the facts on the ground. And one of the key facts is knowing about our population, the demographics of our population. And so I am never in a public forum without emphasizing the importance of the upcoming 2020 census. We're just a year out, and it is so important that we get an accurate census count so that we can plan much more intelligently. Next week, the US Supreme Court is going to hear um, an appeal from the three courts, three federal courts that so far have struck down the citizenship question, and a lot rides on that because we know there's fear in our immigrant communities and that that could lead to an undercount. So turning to your question, I think that when we see um, community objections, it is about a fear of growth, but I think even more it's about change. When you affect people where they live, most people, no matter how progressive their politics, are very, very conservative. And I think that this can be a special challenge in lower income minority and immigrant communities who may feel that they have little voice and no options. Um, I think a perfect example of the fear of change is El Barrio, East Harlem, where Hope, I know it's where you grew up. We think of it today as a thriving Hispanic neighborhood. Who would know that it has a very quickly growing Chinese community? If we look backwards in time, it was a Jewish community, a German community, an Italian community. And so the question is, how do we manage this change? Part of it is what all the panelists have stressed. You have to engage community stakeholders. But we also have to recognize that communities rarely speak with one voice. The people who show up at public hearings are a certain subset. 
a homeowner, a longtime homeowner, may have a very different perspective from a current renter, from a small business owner. And then there is also the question of who gives voice to the homeless population for those who want to move into the neighborhood, um, for children who would want to remain in the neighborhood but more independently than in their uh, parents' basement. There's also the other challenge of who represents citywide interests. The more one devolves power to the local community, the so-called aldermanic privilege that one sees very strongly in, say, a Chicago, um, what does that say about the need for a community to house jails, homeless shelters, waste transfer stations? There is no local council member who one would expect to raise her hand and say, put it in my district, but yet, as a city, we have to be responsible for this. I do think there are a couple of things. One is to recognize that we have to bring the full panoply of tools to the table. As much as I love land use and zoning, we have to bring housing preservation. We have to bring our parks departments, our departments of transportation, our schools, um, but also small business services, but also mental health, health and mental health. The solution to address change is to bring all of these tools together. And then finally, I think we have to take advantage of technology. Um, we are in the midst of rezoning, uh, of a study that will lead to a rezoning of the Gowanus neighborhood in Brooklyn. I think there are very few cities that have a Superfund site and say, hey, that is the neighborhood of tomorrow. <laughs> um, the residents who are there now are quite tech savvy. And so in addition to the Saturday street fairs where we got input into the neighborhood weekend, um, weeknight meetings, we set up a portal for people to submit comments on the various proposals online, and that has proven to be an extremely fertile way. One has to think about different communities will require different outreach, but we should never underestimate <coughs> the importance of technology to allow us to hear from more of our stakeholders. Well, I think that uh, she said actually everything that mm. needed to be said. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she just stole you go everything. For, you go first next time. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> You know, uh, what's interesting is that, you know, just in Newark, you know, we there are people who advocate for us to do something about the homeless, and those are the same people who protest for it not to be in their neighborhood. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but, I mean, so that, that goes to that point. But I think everybody has a plan. So when you say we need a plan, I think everybody has one. Uh, seldom do the plans incorporate everyone. Uh, and uh, the city's job uh, should be... Uh, how to create a plan that uh, speaks to everybody's needs, uh, no matter how diverse those needs are, uh, and try to be very specific about that. And, and what was said that is right on the money is that a lot of people come and say, we represent the community, uh, and they represent the six people they know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and the community is, is very, very broad, is very diverse, um, and you get caught up in, in listening to people who say, uh, we represent the community and you follow what they say, then you'll have those other folks down at City Hall yelling and screaming at you because you did what those people say. <laughs> They'll say they, they didn't invite me to the meeting, <laughs> right? And so you, you have to, uh, it's better to begin the planning on the ground uh, in those neighborhoods, begin to have the discussions there uh, and have many outlets for people to weigh in uh, through technology. Uh, but there's no nothing, be nothing better than going to the people themselves and having a face-to-face -face kind of discussion, no matter how long it takes, right? Because uh, you could be at a meeting to 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night, but they have to live in the community for 20 years. You don't, mm, right. right? So the the point is, you should sacrifice that to be able to be to to go there, whether the meeting is contentious or not. Right, and you have to tell people, look, the meeting will be contentious. The idea of democracy is that everyone doesn't have to agree with you. Right, they don't. I mean, does, you don't have to do what everybody says, but they don't. They obviously don't have to agree with you. And if, if uh, a part of me going to the meeting is that everybody has to agree with me, I mean, there's a level of narcissism there that <laughs> says that you shouldn't go to the meeting, right? You should send somebody else. Uh, but, but, but obviously, you have to be prepared to go and get into a back and forth with people about what they think is right and what they think is good uh, in their neighborhood. And and everybody comes to the table with these kind of notions of what they think is all right. And the fear of gentrification and other kind of things plays into 
uh, uh, a lot of the stuff that's going on. And people use it sometimes as fodder. So you have people arguing yeah. that we shouldn't build uh, certain buildings with height because it'll automatically bring, bring justification. And that's not necessarily the truth, right? Because we've lived in decades in buildings in Newark that have been 20, 30 stories. Those buildings were called projects and everybody who lived in there were low income, right? So the, the, the height of the building itself does not necessarily attract gentrification. It's the, the, the market that does that, right? And, and, and more importantly, the New York City market that creates the mm -hmm. problem for us in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, if, if, if New York wasn't as expensive as it is, I mean, it wouldn't trigger what's happening uh, uh, in New Jersey, in northern New Jersey. So we have to uh, uh, deal with that. And, and it forces us uh, to consider housing in a different way. And the last thing I want to say about that is that when we talk about affordability, uh, affordability means different things to different people. Yeah. And so we have to be able to have a wider view of what affordability means. Uh, at one point, we were just talking about low income. Now, uh, you know, affordability uh, affects so many different people, right? And so when you talk about affordability, you have to be very clear on who you're talking about. Uh, and we have to have a discussion around the AMI itself. Like, mm -hmm. what is... Where are we getting this AMI from, and, and how are we using it? Are we using countywide? Is there a city? Are we using HUD? Are there federal guidelines? And, and what are we using that will allow us to create the affordability that we need and also uh, allow developers to make money at the same right. time? Because that's simply what developers are there. They, they're there to make money. It's a business deal, but that's not our uh, business up here. Our business is to create opportunity and housing for people, mm -hmm. which sometimes conflicts what the developers are trying to do, which is necessary for us to have these meetings, as many as we need. So Newark is growing, and um, you're obviously you're being very successful in growing that economy. How do, you, how do you talk about growth in community? Do we need to talk about growth differently? Do we need a different language? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, because when people, when people don't necessarily, like in, 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 in Newark, and I would imagine in other communities, when they, when, first of all, people have been locked out for decades, right? Decades. Uh, have not been involved in, in, in these kinds of things. So when you start talking about growth in cities like, like Newark, like Jackson, like, you know, Cleveland, places like that, folks think you're talking about someone else. Growth to, to, to people means that people are coming to their neighborhood, they're going to make some money, uh, and they're going to leave. The downtown is going to look nice, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have a real impact on me. And then that growth starts to creep its way up the corridor uh, and find its way in my backyard, and ultimately now I have to go uh, because the growth doesn't involve me, right? And so we have to begin. I have to struggle with talking about it in, in, in a way where it's equitable, where it's inclusive. So we have an equitable growth commission that we've created in the city of Newark to begin with Rutgers University and some other folks to begin talking about how do we deal with growth in an equitable way? How do we create ownership, right? How do we uh, have stronger rent control? How do, how do we protect people from being illegally evicted from their homes, right? How do we uh, create parts of the community that we will land, uh, uh, preserve for affordability, that we begin to land bank and plan in a, in a large way and not just uh, in this kind of arbitrary way where a developer comes and says, this is nice, I want to buy this. And then that creates development as opposed to us uh, land banking this and say, this is what we want to see in this area. Uh, and we want to put RFPs out, RFQs out to get developers that are interested in developing what we think should be in this area and create all kind of funding opportunities uh, to, to uh, entice them to be in there. And because they're getting subsidy, they have to understand that it's not a giveaway, but it's, it's a partnership. And people look at subsidy as giveaway. So when you say subsidy, then you get all these signs that go up. <laughs> they say, oh, you're giving people things. Mm -hmm. oh, we're not giving anything away. Uh, you know, we, we are, this is quid pro quo. Right? There's a, a kind of benefits agreement. There's something that they're paying for here, right? Uh, and this idea that people think that when, when, when you give, for example, an abatement, you're talking about money that you don't have yet. 
Like, so, yes, exactly. Uh, so you, you, <laughs> pe people are always talking about, oh, you 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 can be doing this with that money, right. but that money doesn't exist. There is no right. <laughs> right? <laughs> if I had fifty billion dollars, I would be doing this, but we don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> right? And we would be doing it if we had it, yeah. but we don't have it. So the development is bringing the wealth into the community. So we we have to talk about it in that way. So that money is coming because of this development. Uh, and these are the things that we want to do as it gets here, right? This is the kind of give and take that we're getting. And you have to make people more s smarter uh, on those issues, and I, I don't think they are. I think another piece of that um, is it's relatively easy to be anti-growth when our region has been in such an incredible era of prosperity. Mm -hmm. And memories are very short, and I find myself feeling old having this conversation about when I worked at the city's Department of Housing in 2008, I had a huge pipeline of housing that in two weeks was lost. I mean, every bank, every bank except mm. for Chase pulled out of every deal that we had, mm. and our pipeline in two weeks went from, I don't know, let's say we were doing 50 deals that, that June to 10, mm -hmm. and it was only 100% low-income rental Chase. That was it. Every other thing was out. I mean, and, it's, and that to me, you know, when I see opportunities like Amazon or anything that will diversify the economy, that's important. And, you know, I've, 10 years, that's only a decade ago, and it's mm -hmm. going to happen again. And I think we have to help educate the new um, generation of leadership coming up to just remember that we can't take today for granted. If I can build on that as the oldest member of the panel, I worked <laughs> I worked in the Koch administration when the city was depopulating, when we were losing jobs, when New Jersey was that evil empire on the other side of the Hudson, and when Long Island was just stealing our middle class families. Mm -hmm. And I do think that we have been so fortunate by having this very, very long period of sustained growth. But any economist will tell you, it won't last. Mm -hmm. And so I think to the mayor's point that, of course, we as the representatives, um, the people who serve the public, have to look out for that interest. But we also have to have an eye on economics. If we pass requirements that don't result in the construction of housing, we're not doing ourselves any favors. Um, I like to quote Seth Pinsky, a former head of New York City's Economic Development Corporation, that you can't be for affordable housing and against density. There's an equation that's at work there. Um, I do think um, th with the focus on facts, we frequently in the city are told you are only building affordable housing in the poorest neighborhoods. We knew that wasn't, we, we knew, um, we felt that that wasn't the case, but we went out and we did the research. If you look at all of the housing units constructed in the city since 2010, a period of very significant growth, look at the neighborhoods, the 25% of neighborhoods that are the wealthiest, and you will find a third of all of the housing units that were completed, so a disproportionate amount. We then said, aha, let's look at the affordable housing units. Again, the 25% wealthiest neighborhoods housed a third of all of the affordable housing units. And so I do think we as planners always have to get back to being based on facts and spreading misperceptions, uh, stopping misperceptions. A final observation that I'll make is I think we need to have an honest conversation about supportive housing and about public housing. Supportive housing with a need not just for construction costs but ongoing subsidy is not about making the numbers work to get the housing delivered. It is a poverty program. It is housing that is going to require subsidy year after year after year. And so I don't think we should allow misinformation that somehow if you build it, it will magically solve the issue is enough. Um, it is a time, I think, where despite the headwinds in Washington, we have to continue to say, yes, there is a very significant role for cities and for states. But when one deals with anti-poverty programs, we again need the federal government to step up as it did both post-World War II and during the Great Society. That's right. One thing I just want to add. Um, I'm trying to get you to come to Newark. <laughs> New York. <laughs> Meeting in Newark, is that good? <laughs> Carolyn's going to make that happen. <laughs> um, one thing I just want to add, there's a, uh, we've spent a lot of time appropriately talking about sort of the, the housing development um, 
politics for lack of a better word. It's a kind of a different set of flavors and, and textures when you're dealing with commercial and, and bringing jobs downtown. The mayor, was, mayor and his team have been fantastic in, at this in, in Newark. What is the actual local impact of bringing jobs from, say, the suburbs or from New York City or someplace else to a city like Newark? And who's going to get those jobs and who's able to participate in that, in that income stream? Um, and so doing the right things at the local level and at the state level, if we're going to be incentivizing those things, for example, which we do with pretty great frequency, um, you know, what are we doing around the workforce development end of this? What are we doing on the training side of this to help folks who, um, you know, maybe neighbors or, or, you know, in the same community where, a, you know, a new office building is being built or, or re rebuilt? Um, and I don't think we've done that perfectly, and there's no perfect way to do it, but it's a really important sort of intentionality that you've got to have. And, again, Mayor Barack is at the head of the class uh, of folks I've gotten to to work with in terms of thinking about not just local hiring, local purchasing, all those things. If you're, if you're on the commercial side of this, a little bit less so on the residential, but on the commercial side of this, making sure that the neighborhoods the, and the communities these are happening in, which again, we want to see happen, that's great, but wh where's that, where's, where is that spillover effect uh, going and who's getting, who's getting in on it? And it's got to be equitable. It's gotta be, you've got to be purposeful about that again from the outset or it won't happen. Okay. So my last question, um, and this is really around public engagement. Um, so. It's widely thought that when it comes to public engagement, a stitch in time saves nine. Mm -hmm. I would like um, you to argue the for or against um, and, and tell a little bit about a project where um, that has uh, been the case. Well, I think Tim said it very well. I think that pretty much what you said is a stitch in time saves nine. Uh, saves nine. <laughs> Don't engage in the sixth inning mm -hmm. like you said you got to get right in right at the yeah. beginning and I think you know what we've done at the hub has sh so far proven that that's the case um, you know and I just want to say briefly Marissa was talking about in the 70s NASA was sucking all of the middle class families <laughs> out of the city well now it's the reverse now the city is sucking all of our young people out of Nassau County. So we're evolving as a suburb, and like any kind of evolution, it's kind of painful. It happens and fits and starts, but it really has to happen. And just one interesting factoid, we have a place called Lynbrook in Nassau County, which is a twist on Brooklyn. When people were moving from the city, they took the name of where they That's came from hilarious. and just turned it around. That's why it's called Lynbrook. Oh, my. Oh. Oh. That's great. Isn't it? I mean, I think probably all of us are going to agree with, with your premise, Hope, I would guess. Um, it, we've all experienced what happens when, when it does come late in the game. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think I would agree with that, that it has to come early, but it also has to be meaningful, right? I mean, you could be cynical and just say do it so that you can check that box, but I've never worked with community on a project and not had the project be better as a result of it. Yeah, I, I will argue against my prior position, but like, <laughs> like one, one scintilla, one tiny bit. Um, it depends on where you are in the life cycle of your, of your revitalization. So, you know, if, you're, if you've had lots of successful projects um, and you've got market momentum and you've got a belief of a you know, competitive investment market, you can get more good stuff from the development community. If it's the first investment, if you've got the real pioneers, there's a different risk appetite there. And you've got a, um, a not to say that community engagement isn't, isn't vitally important, but I think the, the realistic expectations of kind of what you can ask for are different, uh, and getting that momentum going can, can be important. So I still think 100% what I said was right the first time, but um, I think it, it, it varies by place based on where you are in your life cycle. Well, I'm going to be controversial because I'll agree, but also strongly disagree. Um, and I'll use two projects. The agreement is what happened with Greater East Midtown. The first time through, it failed. There wasn't as much community engagement. The second time through, having failed to rezone East Midtown, um, a steering committee was set up led by the borough president and the local council member. City planning was invited to participate as technical experts, but we weren't there. All of the community stakeholders from the businesses, both the landowners and the businesses that had their headquarters here in, I would say, the cities, but also the nation's premier business district, were at the table, as were the residents in the surrounding area. Um, we undertook a very major rezoning of the area right around this building. Why? Because the area was had lots of jobs. The buildings were on average 70 years old, and they were not suitable for the needs of today. But because of we failed the first time, had significant engagement the second time, 
we listened to the community and realized that in addition to needing new buildings, we needed investments in the subway system here at Grand Central, but also in the public realm, the sidewalks, the streetscapes around here. And so that engagement the second time around um, led to what you're seeing. If you step outside, look up and look at one Vanderbilt. It is a stunning new office building immediately adjacent to Grand Central. I love good architecture. I love seeing space for jobs, but what I love even more is that one building is contributing $220 million in improvements to Grand Central Station, the subways underneath it, and the pedestrian realm. So that's an example of it working. I think there are times, though, when it doesn't work, and we've had a really painful recent one. Industry City is in Sunset Park in Brooklyn. If you've ever driven down the Gowanus, you've seen these beautiful old loft buildings that have sat abandoned since the maritime industry left New the New York side of the harbor. Um, we have a development team there that worked with the community for two years. And during that time, they invested untold amounts of money in rehabbing portions of Industry City in workforce development that tied in to the Sunset Park community. But the reality is that the vast majority of the space there is still used for warehousing. Warehousing is important, but it does not um, provide nearly the jobs. Again, the development team worked with the community on a plan for additional commercial space there, for a hotel there, because of the amount of jobs that were being created, um, and allowing an institution there. After two years of engagement, the project was ready to enter ULERP a formal seven-month public review process that we have in the city that has a minimum of four public hearings, which can be very contentious. Um, the elected officials, three days before the formal public review was to commence, said, no, stop. We want another six months before you can even start the public review. And I think that that is a very troubling precedent that one can't even begin the discussion during the public review process. And so I do think in that instance, it is perhaps a sign of what Holly had said, just so many years of sustained growth and just taking for granted that one can say no, no, and no, and somehow the city will still continue to thrive. Well, the, the, I would say one of the things that we uh, had in Newark that were very contentious around MX3, um, I think the what, what I talked about earlier, folks did not want to engage early on because uh, they knew it was going to be contentious. Uh, and so we want, uh, what happened is we wound up going to court and they didn't do everything properly, so we had to do it again. So we wound up taking longer than we would have if we just engaged the community early on. And I think what we, what we tend to do is we, we allow the people who usually come out to all of the events to be the community. And we're, con we're content with that. We, we allow them to come. And instead of us actively going out and making sure other people are at these meetings, oh. that we fill the meeting up with the actual community and not with the 10 people who call themselves the community, right? To go out and knock on doors like a campaign and tell people, we, we need you to come. We need you to be a part of it. And when you do that, you, you, mm -hmm. you begin to see that there are more people in the community who are actually level-headed who want to think about this, right, who, who, who engage back and forth with you, whether they agree or not, they're, they're willing to at least uh, compromise on a few things to make the project work because they understand that this might be necessary. So we're arguing now whether 10 stories versus 12 stories is going to be the tipping point for gentrification in, in, a, in a particular area, which is like bizarre to me, but uh, at, at, at the end of the day, that's what the argument has been boiled down to when really it's come to like four or five people who think that the builders are going to block their view of the Passaic, right? Mm. And so uh, at the end of the day, uh, and, and I have to explain to them that the, the density that we're trying to create in this transit-oriented stuff helps us to deal with affordability in other parts of the city. Uh, and, I, and I do want to let folks in on a secret here that uh, most people don't want to live downtown in your neighborhoods. People don't want to live down there. They just want their neighborhoods better. Right? They don't want to move. That's so when we start talking about 
this this discussion about should we create affordability in specific areas of the city one democratically i agree that that should happen you shouldn't lock people out of areas uh because they don't have the economic wherewithal to live there that there should be opportunities for them to live in those parts of the community but people really want to live in their own neighborhood right they just want it to look better because mm -hmm. it's, it's it's difficult for me to live downtown uh, and not have access because we don't live in New York. I don't have a subway, right? So, I, how am I going to get to school? How are my kids going to get to school? How am I going to get to the supermarket? How am I going to eat? How, all of these things are important for me. So, we need to be able to create opportunity, uh, economic growth, not just economic development, economic growth where it helps other parts of the city sustain themselves but also develop in a way that their community looks just as nice as other places in the city, so they don't have to have a fight with you about living downtown. They, nine times out of 10, they don't want to come down there. They would, they would, they're more than happy with living where they are. They just don't want to live next to vacant lots and abandoned buildings and rodents mm -hmm. and, and crime. That's, they, don't, they don't want that, right? And they think that you're taking the, the wealth and all of the good things and you are you know, segregating it to you and I, get to, I have to live like this. And then when the community gets better, now I gotta go, yeah. right? And so we have to figure that out. A, a quick dovetail and on both the mayor and Marissa's comments, which you really do have to think of different ways to engage community, so you don't just get the same voices. I mean, we we found with Belmont, the same opposition group was very very um, organized. They could show three hundred people up at every meeting. And the people who actually live in Elmont told us, and, and I saw why, they did not want to go there and right. get screamed at by 300 angry people. Mm -hmm. And the few brave individuals that showed up, literally, it was so offensive. The response they got, they didn't want to come back. And right. so I think it's the onus is on all of us to think of creative ways, whether it's technology and portals, or what we did is anybody who had a small group, we went and met with them individually. So we were just out there mm. constantly in the community meeting with, you know, 10 moms a tenant association, and I think that is on us to do that so we are not just hearing the loudest voices. Thank you. So we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. Are there any questions? Yes, in the back. Hi. Uh, I, I want to do two things very quickly because I know we're out of time, but uh, I want to question the image hub, and I also want to offer some, comf uh, some comfort for losing the 450 office jobs in your in your development, uh, Commissioner, and, and also the whatever high-tech jobs were lost in, in uh, or not gained in, in Long Island City. Uh, first of all, uh, just very quick, nobody wants to live in a hub, okay? Uh, you know, the, the hub is a really nasty place to be on a wheel or anywhere else, you know, there's a lot of gears going, there's a lot of bearings. All of you want to have hubs. All of you want to have hubs. Get rid of the idea, okay? The, the business end of a wheel is where the rubber meets the road. That's where you want to be, okay? The, uh, 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 the, the other thing, uh, you don't have to worry about Brooklyn anymore. You don't have to worry about Queens anymore, you know, and to some extent you never had to. Jane Jacobs observed, you know, 50, more than 50 years ago that uh, Brooklyn uh, gestates far, far more jobs than they export, and they still do. Uh, those 450 jobs were not lost. The thing that you have to look at maybe is instead how Brooklyn develops jobs informally. And so you look at the condo rules, you look at the residential zoning rules, and you encourage, you know, home occupations, uh, gig venues. Uh, you, you encourage all the things that invent jobs, don't just attract jobs, but invent jobs. And so you wind up in your, your development in central Brooklyn with, you know, Parsons kids making designer handbags in the spare bedroom. And then, hopefully, you know, moving to a hub in Newark or Jamaica or, or Patterson or what have you. I think he's talking about my hub and I have to start <laughs> by fundamentally disagreeing. The beauty of New York City is that we can have people who live in a neighborhood that looks like the most bucolic corners of Nassau County and others, the 12,000 folks who love living in downtown Brooklyn, being in the center of it. I do have to agree with you, though, that I think that um, we need more flexibility in our zoning to meet the evolving nature of work. 
if you look at our zoning outside of Manhattan for manufacturing um, areas, it assumes that you have a one-story building surrounded by a sea of parking. Why? Because most of that zoning was adopted in 1961 when the factories were moving from Brooklyn to Nassau County right over the border. That vision makes absolutely no sense in our manufacturing areas that are next to subway stations. We can have a successful manufacturer who is allowed to only have a one-story building, wants to put a second story to create more jobs, and can't because of our parking requirements. Um, the beautiful loft buildings that you see rehabbed and being brought to life with jobs in Long Island City, in Jamaica, in Dumbo, those couldn't be built today under our zoning, which assumes that any kind of industrial use is on one story. We're now seeing thriving businesses coming in saying, I want a five-story building, maybe a 10-story building for light industry. And so we are undertaking a comprehensive look at our manufacturing zoning with an eye towards getting it out of the way of our evolving jobs economy. One more question. Uh, a lot of the discussion today has been uh, qualitative, and I'm, I'm wondering about the quantitative side. I, uh, you know, with the, the failure of the, uh, the attempted pulling of the Amazon in New York, so much of the discussion was about whether or not it would actually produce the benefits intended or whether those benefits were the right benefits. And I'm wondering about how you, as leaders, are thinking about measuring the output of your activity and what are the metrics that really matter. What should we be measuring? Um, and what maybe should we not be measuring? What, what, what have we been counting that was just a mistake because we weren't getting the results we yet? I'm glad to give one quantitative answer. Um, we, and this goes back to the issue of density and affordability. Um, even in New York City, there are people who are opposed to height. Now, we would consider 12 stories a mid-rise building. Uh, no. um, but in, uh, in New York, we will admit that a 40-story building is a tall building. And so we took a look at all of the buildings, residential buildings, that were completed in 2017. Buildings of 40 stories or more compromised 1% of the number of buildings that were completed. There were just 18 of them. But those 18 buildings, that 1% produced over 20% of the housing units. And so that is what we think is an important mm -hmm. metric. Let's look at the building types that are actually meeting the needs for housing in our city. I would just add, I think, I think you're right um, that we should be measuring the impacts of particularly incentive programs. Um, I, certainly something I learned in Amazon is how misunderstood um, the states and cities incentive programs are. It's not my main bailiwick. I'm more on the real estate side, but it was sort of shocking to me um, that there's not better understanding of how those work. Um, to the mayor's point about, you know, now can we spend that? Five hundred million dollars on something else, and it doesn't exist. Um, but I think at the state, we've got we have um, put into place um, after you know learning learning the lesson the hard way in past years a lot more metrics and reporting in order to measure you know what are the returns on the pro incentive programs we have um, and have gotten on some of the programs that have been longer lasting. We we have a pretty good sense of how much are we getting back on each dollar we're putting in. Um, so. That takes time to get really reliable data, but we have a lot of metrics um, that we're now being able to measure that to figure out, which I think is important. I, I think that, you know, historically, people were getting incentives without giving anything in return, which is why the cynicism is there. People believe that you're giving things away because the, the, the idea was that uh, ultimately, just by having a development, the development would in turn affect the economy and the economy would blossom because there's all this development in the area but one didn't equal the other right so there was no there was no measurement created because there was no one was looking for a measurement they just thought that this stuff would happen by osmosis and that there was no real deliberative thing that you needed to do to encourage growth and development in your city i think now uh people are beginning to understand with these community benefits agreements uh you know so 
I think the problem with that is people now want parks, they want these things, they want that, and and I I, I honestly believe that those are things that should come with the development anyway and should not be quid pro quo hmm. in terms of tax uh, benefits or tax incentives or other things to a project, right? Those projects should have long-term kind of uh, economic sustainability that's centered around job growth and development, how many jobs are created, how many long-term permanent jobs are there, uh, the demographic of those jobs, where they're going to, procurement dollars that are going into the neighborhoods and the community. Are you supporting small local businesses? How is it affecting the infrastructure uh, uh, in, the, in those cities, in and around those areas? All of that stuff has to be measured uh, in terms of what do we get back because ultimately the tax break that you're getting uh, uh, is money that we could use if we had those taxes to invest in those things that we're not gonna be able to invest in 10 years from now because that money is missing. So we need you to help us invest in those areas, whether it's job growth, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's helping us to create housing, uh, uh, if we had additional taxes, right? Uh, to ex and explaining to people that we don't have that money is a whole nother thing. Because you're arguing with people all the time. <laughs> We're telling people, oh, they're giving $100 million away, mm -hmm. which is absolutely not true. Because mm -hmm. if the development won't happen, you'll be in the same place you were in when if the, if the development you know didn't come at all because you have no money. And so the idea is to invite them in, create wealth, but then trap it in a way, the wealth, so it doesn't leave the city you know, and go somewhere else and use that wealth uh, uh, to begin to create jobs, housing, infrastructure. Well, this yeah, has been a terrific a discussion. <laughs>